Hello everyone. So as a part of the continuation of INI CT series, so today we will be discussing about the arrhythmias. So I am myself Dr. Rajesh Guba. I am the general medicine educator. So in the today's discussion, I will be giving you various clinical scenarios of arrhythmias and you should tell me what is the appropriate treatment that you have to give to that clinical condition. So yes, before going ahead with the discussion, you try to answer this question in the comment section. Recurrent episodes of atrial flutter are treated with metoprolol, sotalol, acetabutalol, atenolol. Please answer this question in the comment section. So before that, if you did not subscribe to this channel, please don't forget to subscribe for updates related to the general medicine. So starting with the first important clinical scenario. The first scenario is the treatment of 65 year old man with atrial fibrillation of longer than 48 hours before DC cardioversion. So this point is very, very important here. That is longer than 48 hours. So an individual with atrial fibrillation longer than 48 hours, please remember that he is at risk of the thrombus formation within the atria, right? So because he is at risk of thrombus formation within the atria, definitely you need to give anticoagulation. So anticoagulation has to be given. Now along with the anticoagulation, the other very very important drug is to control the rate, to control the heart rate. So for that we give either digoxin or a beta blocker that is metoprolol or a calcium channel blocker that is DTASM and verapamil. So, among the options, we will search for which option has anticoagulant along with digoxin or a beta blocker. So the answer is D that is digoxin plus warfarin should be given for a month. See, you also have sotalol plus warfarin, but sotalol preferably we don't give this as a first line in the treatment of the atrial fibrillation. So here the during this particular time of anticoagulation, the ventricular rate is controlled by prescribing digoxin. Now, which patients, okay, here too, definitely more than 48 hours is there, you need to anticoagulate. But otherwise, which patients of atrial fibrillation require the anticoagulation is a very, very important question. So, for which I'll tell you two important scores. One is your char 2 ds 2 VAS scoring system. So in this char 2 ds 2 VAS scoring system, you have the various parameters that is congestive heart failure, hypertension, age of the individual more than 75 years, diabetes, stroke, vascular disease, age more than 65 years and female gender. So accordingly, the points are given. So if the individual score is zero, then no therapy or aspirin can be given. For suppose, if the individual score is one, then either you give aspirin or oral anticoagulant. And if the individual score is 2, you need to give an oral anticoagulant definitely. Either warfarin or your NOAX, newer oral anticoagulant drugs can be given. So that is based on your char 2 ds 2 VAS scoring system. Then once you start the oral anticoagulants, the individual is at risk of bleeding. So what is the chance of bleeding when you start the oral anticoagulants? right is decided by your Hess blood score. Now what are the parameters of the Hess blood? H stands for the hypertension, A is abnormal liver or renal function, S is stroke, B bleeding, Libile INR is L, E stands for elderly individuals more than 65 years, D stands for drug or alcohol. So total score if you see it is around 9 and if the Hess blood score if it is more than three, the individual is at risk, increased risk of bleeding. So please remember these two scores. One is your char 2 ds 2 VAS scoring system, whether to give antiplatelet or anticoagulant. Then Hess blood score, whether what is the risk of bleeding can be decided by your Hess blood score. Now, you take the second important clinical scenario. Second scenario is initial therapy in a 60 year old woman presenting severely compromised with acute persistent atrial fibrillation. So now here, this point is very, very important. That is severely compromised. Please remember any form of arrhythmia, if the individual is hemodynamically unstable, 
or if the individual is severely compromised the first line treatment in that patient should be dc shock right the first line treatment should be dc shock so among the options you search for where you have the dc shock that is dc shock plus heparin should be given so in case in this case immediate dc shock is indicated because the patient is severely compromised and administration of heparin decreases but does not abolish the risk of thromboembolism after cardioversion now you are planning to give immediate dc shock now when you are planning to give immediate dc shock how much strength you should give that is around 200 joules of synchronized dc shock should be given now let me tell you some quick pointers related to the treatment of atrial fibrillation so what are the drugs with which you will achieve acute rate control in atrial fibrillation that is beta blocker or verapamil whereas acute rate control with acute congestive heart failure please remember in congestive heart failure we don't give beta blockers beta blockers are contraindicated so in them you need to give digoxin whereas chronic rate control is done either of these drugs either beta blocker or calcium channel blocker or digoxin can be given and if above fails then you need to do catheter ablation right so this is about the treatment of the atrial fibrillation now let me discuss few ventricular arrhythmias so the third important scenario is a 55 year old man admitted with an acute myocardial infarction develops a short run of vt he requires treatment for prophylaxis against recurrent ventricular tachycardia so what is that you will give see he wants a drug for vt right why because he had a short run of vt in a patient with acute mi for prophylaxis what is the drug you will give so the prophylaxis what we can give is amiodarone so among the options just search for where is your amiodarone so the answer is amiodarone it is not warfarin right it is not oral amiodarone plus warfarin it should be intravenous amiodarone right and along with that definitely in patients with an acute mi you will be giving the anticoagulation in the form of heparin or you might have thrombolyzed the patient that history is not there but please remember for prophylaxis what we give is intravenous amiodarone now if you take this amiodarone it has the action of all the four classes of anti-arrhythmic drugs that is it has class 1 2 3 4 actions but it is used clinically for its class 4 action sorry class 3 action now what is this class 3 action remember your class 3 drugs they prolong the plateau phase of the cardiac action potential you see this is the plateau phase of the cardiac action potential so class 3 drugs they prolong the plateau phase of cardiac action potential and increase the absolute refractory period and because they are prolonging the plateau phase of the cardiac action potential remember they can prolong the qt interval as well so your amiodarone it can prolong qt interval and it can precipitate to the development of torsades d pointers okay so class 3 drugs they prolong the plateau phase of cardiac action potential and they increase the absolute refractory period and this amiodarone is considered as drug of choice to treat the ventricular tachycardia and when you are giving this amiodarone for long term it is associated with the adverse effects but if you take our scenario now it is it's an acute scenario so if at all if you are giving the amiodarone for longer duration what all will be the adverse effects that includes bradycardia pulmonary fibrosis hepatic fibrosis corneal micro deposits then photosensitivity rash and as well as the thyroid dysfunction so these are the adverse effects which are associated with long-term use of the amiodarone okay right now let me just show you some ecgs of short run of the vts now you see this so this is like a very short run of vt and it is a monomorphic vt which is non-sustained vt right monomorphic vt which is a non-sustained vt and when will you use the word sustained vt if the duration of the vt is more than three seconds right then we use the word it as the sustained vt right 
next then now we'll move on to the fourth important clinical scenario drug to aid the diagnosis in a 50 year old man presenting with an unidentifiable unidentifiable regular narrow complex tachycardia so you see here it's a narrow complex tachycardia so which will be your narrow complex tachycardia your svts atrial fibrillation atrial flutter sinus tachycardia so they are like narrow complex tachycardias but here the individual is having regular unidentifiable regular so when we are using the word regular you take atrial fibrillation it is irregularly irregular rhythm you take atrial flut flutter in atrial flutter also there can be either regularly irregular or irregularly irregular rhythm so definitely this patient is having your svt right so in case of svt what is the ideal drug that can be given the ideal drug is the intravenous adenosine but remember in case of svt before giving the adenosine right we need to induce the vagal maneuvers so like we have a vagal maneuver which is a modified valsalva so this is very very important for you to remember right so what we are following this is now this one that is modified valsalva so in modified valsalva what we will do is you need to position the patient with legs flat and head end of the bed 45 degrees right head end of the bed 45 degrees then in this position what you have to do is uh, the patient should attempt to blow out the plunger of 10 ml syringe for 15 seconds you see he is blowing the syringe which is of 10 ml syringe and he is blowing out for nearly around 15 seconds after that you need to quickly reposition the patient's head right so this is the repositioning of the patient's head of the bed to completely flat and have the other assistant raise the legs to 45 degrees for another 15 seconds so he has to raise the legs for up to 45 degrees for nearly around another 15 seconds then lastly return the head of the bed to 45 degrees again right return the head of the bed to 45 degrees and continue to monitor for resolution for one minute and if needed repeat it again so this is about how you have to do the modified valsalva maneuver okay now so if this modified valsalva fails then we give this particular adenosine so this adenosine it has a profound short-term av block effect right and this adenosine it is used to terminate the tachycardias involving the av re-entry circuit and it is also the one which is used in the diagnosis of unidentifiable arrhythmias but the adverse effects of adenosine is that adenosine can cause severe bronchoconstriction and not only that it stimulates the nociceptive neurons within the heart so when you are giving this adenosine what is that advice you should give to the patient is that the patient should be warned in advance that he may experience the chest pain after the drug is administered so this is a very very important advice that you should give whenever you are giving adenosine so this is about the fourth clinical scenario unidentifiable narrow complex tachycardia what is the drug that can be given adenosine can be given <coughs> next so you take the fifth clinical scenario that is profile axis of vt in a patient with varying qrs complexes and prolonged qt interval now you see there what exactly is the diagnosis varying qrs axis of prolonged QT interval so prolonged QT interval what is that you can suspect you can suspect the torsades D point is so that is the reason why you want you have to give a drug for prophylaxis of the VT so what is this scenario now this is torsades D point is now this particular torsades D point is it will often degenerate to your ventricular fibrillation leading to cardiac arrest so what are the causes for torsades d point is that includes your drugs which will which will be causing long qt interval i'll show you the drugs also electrolyte disturbances right what are those electrolyte disturbances which can cause 
long QT interval like hypokalemia, then hypocalcemia, then hypomagnesemia. These are the electrolyte disturbances that can cause long QT interval. And finally, you have congenital long QT syndrome. Uh, congenital long QT syndrome are Jervell and Nielsen. Jervell and Lange syndrome, Nielsen syndrome. These are the congenital long QT syndromes. And this conventional antiarrhythmic drugs, that is your class 3 antiarrhythmic drugs, they can worsen this condition. So that is the reason why for torsades D point is you should not give the antiarrhythmic drugs, right? Particularly class 3 antiarrhythmic drugs. So what is the treatment of choice in case of, in case of torsades D point is you need to give intravenous magnesium sulfate and ventricular pacing should be done at a higher rate. So this is about your torsades D point is. And lastly, what are the drugs that will be causing long QT prolongation. So I have given you a mnemonic that is your A, B, C, D, E. A stands for amiodarone, that is anti-arrhythmic drugs. Amiodarone, sotolol, which is a beta blocker, which has both class 2 and class 3 action and flecainide, which is the class 1 anti-arrhythmic drug. And another A is anti-anginal, that is ranolazine. B stands for biotics, that is fluoroquinolone, macrolides and aminoglycosides. C stands for the antipsychotics that is haloperidol, quetiapin and risperidone and D stands for antidepressants that is selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and tricyclic antidepressants and another D stands for diuretics and the last E stands for anti-emetics that is the ondansetron. So these are the drugs that will cause the QT interval prolongation. So this is the today's session. So Please answer this question. Recurrent episodes of atrial flutter are treated with. So you answer your question in the comment box. I'll revert you back. And if you did not subscribe the channel, please subscribe this channel for the more updates related to general medicine. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow again.